Van Gogh. Now, for me to say Van Gogh for an hour is going to hurt my throat. And one time I remember going to Museum of Modern Art and the curator said to me that, um, you know, Michael, the way you say Vincent Van Gogh is incorrect. You have to say Van Gogh. And being a kid from Brooklyn, I wanted to be a wise guy and say, oh, yeah, well, how many times have you been to Amsterdam and seen the original paintings? Anyway, years later, I read a letter he wrote to his brother, Theo, that he said, you might notice, Theo, that I always sign my paintings, Vincent. And the reason I do that, Theo, is because I think the average person will find it hard to pronounce Van Gogh. So immediately, I like Vincent, OK? So behind me is supposedly his last painting. Um, I think, unfortunately, that he did shoot himself. And we'll talk about that later. But I just wanted to start with that. Um, I don't really pay too much attention when people mention um, mental illness or a sexual persuasion. Um, my attitude about artists is that if you take away some of the bad men from Billie Holiday, you take away a heroin addiction from Charlie Parker, you take the church away from Michelangelo and hassling him, and you take some of the emotional trauma in Van Gogh, you may not have the art. Um, they asked Tennessee Williams once, how are you doing? And he said, well, I've got my demons. And the person said, well, let's talk about it. Let's try to see if we can rid ourselves of these demons. And Tennessee Williams' reply was, no, I'd rather not because I'm afraid maybe we'll also get rid of the angels. So people are complicated. I've looked at Van Gogh since, I guess, 10, 12 years old, running to uh, Manhattan to see Starry Night and go to the Museum of Modern Art, the Metropolitan Museum of Art. And... Um, when I had my own kids, I barely let them out of the driveway. Uh, but I think my parents were always hoping I wouldn't make it back from the two buses and trains. Okay. So let's look. This is a self portrait. I'm going to hold them like this. And also, before I even go into the talk, two, two things I want to say. One, I'm very grateful to the Stoughton Senior Center. Uh, for having me here. I love it, uh, presenting these programs. And um, right now, I'm a 21-year employee of the Scholar Nursing and Rehabilitation Center in Stoughton. And I want to thank them for their continued support of these art programs. This particular program was presented last week at Scholar, and it included people from the memory care, assisted living, and skilled. Art, art was made for everyone. So, Vincent van Gogh, an important thing to know about him that's not often said, he was named after an infant who was his older brother who had died shortly after coming into the world. And when Vincent was born, he was given that same name. I remember reading about Elvis Presley. He was a twin, and the twin had died in the womb, and his mother make sure to say to Elvis when he was able to understand, remember Elvis, you're living for two people. Tremendous emotional burden for these young people. Okay. However, my thing about art is emotional collaboration. Why do certain things last generation to generation? Why do we reflect on certain artists? I want to show you something. This is a mosaic from the 12th century. The important thing I want you to see is the emotional bend physically of the body, as well as the expression on the face. Most likely it's a disciple. These are made with tiny mosaic tiles. Okay, And there's a connection, which we're going to look at. Michelangelo, and this is a detail from the Sistine Chapel. And again, if you notice the expression on the people's faces, and we're gonna concentrate really on people today. 
um, I just think for me it tells the story I want to I want to say. Beautiful. If you ask me my favorite artist, it would have to be Michelangelo. And now we come back to Vincent. Vincent had done this when he was placed in the asylum. Um, again, look at the bend of the head all the way back to the 12th century. It's the same positioning, the same pose, the same emotions. In fact, Mary, who's with Christ in this painting, Mary is supposedly, and I'll go with that, is the face of a nurse that was very kind to Vincent at the asylum. And you could see pretty much the face of Christ is really the face of Van Gogh. And look at the colors. This is a printed page. You know what I like about this? Uh, my family won't even allow me to have a phone because uh, I've washed it too many times. Um, I love the idea of paper and new technology. I hope forever we always have books and paper and just combine old and new technology like this. And now we go again, Renaissance. This is Saint Jerome by Leonardo da Vinci. Again, not repeating myself, you could just see the same emotional language coming through the painting. Beautiful, right? Okay, so what does this add up to for me personally? It adds up to when we come to contemporary times. And let's see if I can get a really... If you notice, the physical, emotional language is right there all the way from the 12th century. Um, all these artists, whether they're using photography as their medium or paint or sculpture, they really want to talk to us and tell us something about who these people are. And we definitely know it's a melancholy moment, just like the previous works of art that we had seen. And of course, this is Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and his beloved wife, Coretta Scott King. And that to me is how the art goes through the generations and where the art comes from. Now let's look at another self-portrait by Vincent. I'll try to get my bearings here. There we go. And there's a self-portrait he's done. Now to me, where did Vincent come from as far as artistically? I think in a great many ways, he came from the great Dutch artist Rembrandt. And let's look at what I think was one of his chief mentors. It's a painting by Rembrandt. And I think for me, the, the greatness of Rembrandt was Rembrandt was painting us. Um, in fact, the majority of us are familiar with Norman Rockwell. And Norman Rockwell said one of his favorite artists, if not his favorite, was Rembrandt because he did people, ordinary people, not kings and queens and not the wealthy. And he did us. You could look at this. And I think Van Gogh comes right out of Rembrandt. And we've just seen that. This is W. Eugene Smith. This was a series he did for Life magazine. It was called The Country Doctor. He was the only doctor in this small town. And you could see his face, the emotional language again. And that's how, to me, art is, is made. And that's how it reaches us and why we look at it. Why does Eugene Smith's photo of a country doctor 
last from generation to generation because it's telling us something we could read it like a book i think for me my generation we were taught to read words um but i think we should have been reading also just pictures and what pictures can tell us beautiful beautiful photo And the same emotion comes through in the Pieta by Michelangelo. And Michelangelo always said that I wasn't depicting Christ as dead, taken down from the cross, but I depicted him asleep and waiting to wake up. I think he was approximately 21 years old when he made this. It's a single piece of marble with a big soft hammer and a chisel. once again show you Van Gogh definitely looking at you maybe past us even maybe seeing something in his own his own mind and then Rembrandt self-portrait remarkable remember folks it's just paint and a paintbrush I wanted to show one more photo, again, bringing out this is John and Robert Kennedy. I think it's a hotel room. And this is during the Cuban Missile Crisis. And how do these photographers, besides taking hundreds and hundreds of photos, when do they know they got one special. They got one special by looking at pictures that we've been looking at now and will look at. That's how they got them. They taught themselves visually how to, how to look at the world around them. I'll talk a little bit about Vincent as we look at this. Vincent was always considered a black sheep. Um, I had a friend one time years ago ask me what I thought of Vincent van Gogh and uh, being a wise guy I said Pete I think if he found the right woman had a good job and settled down he'd be happy we may not get his paintings and he said only you could say that I said it that way only because Vincent van Gogh himself wanted to have a family wanted to have a life like a lot of people around him. Unfortunately, he was trying to prove something all the time to his father. He did become a minister like his father, but felt that he failed at it. And he worked with the miners. In fact, he gave them all their clothes and he walked away from the pulpit and really began in earnest to make pictures. It's estimated that he made 900 paintings and drawings and possibly only sold one painting in his lifetime. The majority of all his work happened within a 10 year span. So he, he was working day in and day out. Theo totally supported him. Um, any money that Van Gogh had once he started this journey was supported by his brother. Okay, this is considered his first masterpiece. This is the potato eaters. Um, again, he painted them. If you notice, there's no yellows, no blues. It's a lot of brown. Um, I think it's a lot reminiscent of Rembrandt, his palette. And the hands of the people you get a chance and go online and look at the potato eaters the hands of the people are very gnarled these are working people 
And I think this was his pulpit. So Van Gogh is actually preaching to us by making this painting. That look at these people who supply us with the coal that heats our homes. Where does it come from? It's like Cesar Chavez said before, making a union for the farm workers. We are the people that give you the fruits and vegetables on your table. Look at us. And I think that's what Van Gogh and these artists trying to tell us. Look at us, pay attention. He had, he was named. And what is the legacy of Van Gogh? Maybe possibly brother. the potato eaters? It's a picture like this one. That is. The Dust Bowl Mother. It's an iconic photo by Dorothy Lang. And to me, in a lot of ways, it becomes a religious picture. Um, I, I think you see the kids as John the Baptist and as Christ. And the woman is Mary. And that's my connection. I was told one time by a, a really, really good art teacher. He was, we were listening to the Yankee game on radio. And he said to me, how many times have you seen Starry Night? And I said, I don't know. I've seen it when I was in my teens, my 20s, my 30s. And he said, probably the most important thing anybody has ever said to me about looking at art. He said, starry night changed for you. And I said, what do you mean by that, Bruce? He said, you brought another 10 years of living to that painting. If I looked at this photo when I was 15, I would say, well, these people are in bad shape or something else pretty banal. But as the years go and the connections are made, you could see all the way back to the paintings. These are your modern potato eaters. And how does Dorothy Lang know to pay attention? Because she's also been a student of looking at art history. There's another photo. And the beauty of these pictures, and I'm talking, but the beauty of these pictures is you could look at these and just continue to read them and come back to them and just see the expressions on the kids and the mother. Who else did Vincent influence? One of my favorite artists is Kate Collowitz. And, and there you could see the powerful image. And in my way of thinking, only a female artist can make the bond of mother and child. Beautiful. And again, the expression of the children, just like the expression of the children in the previous photo. Let's look at another one. These are charcoal. This is Kate Collowitz. Again, there's the pathos and then the emotional language of, of mother. Has the child under her wing. And how does that relate? It relates to our era of photography and film. There we go. The expression on the woman's face and her body language. Beautiful. The more we know about someone else, the more we learn about ourselves. This is one of the great iconic photos from Life Magazine. It reminds us in a very tough job, there's a human being there who's soft or relatable. And of course, well, let's see, let me, there we go. And the glow of the, the child looking up. 
and you get the glow of the policeman. Now, when I say the glow, I'll show you something now. There's Rembrandt, and there's the glow. Most likely, this is his mother. He did several paintings using his parents. And she's definitely looking right at us. And then we come back to Vincent. And I think for me, a lot of his brush strokes, his hair, this is a really good photo because it, photo painting, because this is what friends and family thought he was a madman. And the women he fell in love with, whether it was a friends or family, considered their daughters too good to marry someone like him. You can see in this painting how thin he is. Again, most of his money went towards art supplies. And look at those colors, gorgeous. All right, this is our friend Vincent again. Look at the face of the man. You could see life's toll on him, etched across his face. And it's pretty calm, except for the, the man's face. You know, it's as if Van Gogh's saying, you know, this is life. And the eyes are clear. It's a beautiful tribute to this man. Pretty strong. And then we come up again, Dorothy Lang. When I look at this, I picture Henry Fonda in The Grapes of Wrath by John Steinbeck. And again, The Peasant Man by Van Gogh, and then we come to the photo. Now, if you notice the black around her and the almost a light shining either from her or on her. And now we'll look at the next one. And again, the darkness around and there's the light on the face all connected. Now, Vincent van Gogh also studied Buddhism. It's not mentioned too much, but he almost resembles a Tibetan monk shaving his head. His beard is all trimmed. The background is not swirling. I, I think his whole life he was trying to get to a moment of calmness. Okay, now this is gonna be a little bit because we have a lot of reflection. Maybe next time we'll try to do a little, get rid of it more. But this is Starry Night. And I wanted to bring up Starry Night um, for a couple of things. If we look at the top area, it's very active. Let's see if I can do better. Yeah, you could at least see it like that, the swirls, and the sunspots and the stars, but you could see the total action and it, a lot of organized chaos, so to speak, but swirling and emotional. And let's go 
to the town. Let's see. Okay, there we go. And if you notice, the highest building is the church. He was a beautiful letter writer, Vincent. Probably wrote over 1,500 letters to Theo and artists and family. But what I noticed about the town is it's very calm. It's really not swirling as much as the sky. But the majority of the painting is taken up by the swirling of the sky. And I think that represents Van Gogh. I think he wanted to make his calmness larger within him and try to get rid of this chaos that was always with him. But again, who knows if he would have been calm, we may not get Starry Night. Now, a couple of things about Vincent. He did his shoes. And I think there were two reasons. One, he did the shoes because it costs money to have a model. And the second reason I think he did shoes is because it has a personality to shoes. This is a man that's outside a lot. He works hard. It's almost like trying to be a Sherlock Holmes deduction. Um, he definitely, his shoe strings are just about gone. The shoes are just about gone. So this is a poor man who's definitely outside and some of the marks might be paint marks. And he definitely wants you to see the shoes because the background is very calm. And even you could see the strokes on his shoes. And uh, this is his bedroom. And eventually what happens is he shoots himself in his stomach and it crawls back to the town. They try to get treatment to him. There's some controversy about he might have been saved with a little bit of faster treatment. However, it takes him almost three days to die from this wound. And the only good that came out of it, it gave Theo enough time to come from Paris to be at his bedside when he passed. The other thing it tells you, it tells you a little bit about Vincent himself. Pretty simple, he almost lives like a, a monk. And then we saw the shoes and here's a photographer just taking the hands of someone, smoking a cigarette that's not lit. And the wedding ring, her knuckles look like they've been through something. Anyway, I wanted to show you that you, you could just take personal things and give them a language and talk to you. All right, Rembrandt, beautiful again, a remarkable painter. Painting by Vincent, woman alone, solitude, and there's some, if you can make it out, some Japanese prints very influential, not only on Van Gogh, but on the Impressionists like Claude Monet, Pissarro, just to name a few. But again, there's that expression. And I think that Van Gogh could relate to this woman and her expression. And again, not even a, a perfect face.
And I think here's another telling painting by Vincent. He's got himself walking in a circle with other prisoners, and he's right in the middle with that orange hair walking around in an enclosed space. And I think that's part of his own. He felt like that sometimes, and I think that's why he loved to paint outside. He loved the effect of the sun, and he loved the color yellow. Okay, while well, I look for pictures, smoke them if you got them. Okay, I always say to you folks, if you've come to lectures at the Senior Center, or I say it uh, when people are right in person, I say, if I start to see gray smoke coming out of your ears, I'll know it's time to stop. So that'll apply to this. Well, let's talk about numero uno sometimes, and that's the cutting of his ear. Vincent had this dream that he would start an art colony in Arles. And he had met Gauguin sometime in Paris, and he wrote to Theo that he would like to invite Gauguin. And between him and Gauguin, they would start this art colony. Um, and Theo, to make his brother happy, said to Gauguin, who was poor, that I'll give you money if you go down and live with my brother and paint with my brother and kind of support his dream. So Gauguin went. Um, it was a good option. He had no money. And unfortunately, it didn't take long. I remember many years ago, my two best friends, at the time living in Brooklyn growing up, said, Mike, why don't you move in with us? We're getting an apartment in the village and all that. I said, no, I'm not going to do that. And they go, why? Because in a month, I'll kill you both. And that's what it was with Gauguin and Van Gogh. Um, they were like fire and water. Fire was Vincent and the coolness of Gauguin. Vincent, I could have a beer with a warmer personality. Um, Gauguin, I felt was very self-centered, uh, very cold to people when he wanted to be. Anyway, the story is that they had a tremendous row and Gauguin said, I'm leaving, that's it. And Van Gogh, after failed relationships, failed jobs, not selling any work, in a moment, it doesn't take long to make a tragic mistake, cuts off part of his ear, puts it in a little box, and brings it to the local brothel and make sure it gets to one of the ladies that he knows at the brothel. Now it's come out in recent years that it, he went to the brothel, but he wrapped the box like a Christmas present. And when he was at the brothel himself, he would watch a very young woman clean up the tables, cigarettes and sweep the floor. And again, he felt for her empathize with her. And so the story is, this writer research that said the story was, all he had to give to her was part of himself. So he actually brings the ear and it looks like a little Christmas present. And um, of course it's shocking. And that just further cemented his reputation as the madman of the village. This is almost similar in a palette to Rembrandt. In some ways he's looking at us and in some ways he seems to me almost looking inward like he's thinking of something else. 
I like Vincent as a person. Um, it's interesting. We know a lot about him because of the. I'll hold this portrait up while we look. Let's see how we doing. Sorry. Let me get something a little brighter. Okay. Yeah. Let's let's start from the beginning and hold this up. Oh, I don't know why it's dark. Okay. All right. Um. Hmm. Okay. We'll we'll survive. So let me just talk a little bit about and uh, kind of come to a close and and close with the painting that um, was used as an introduction. The, the story goes is that Vincent, um, Theo and his wife come out to visit Vincent and they bring their newly born child and Vincent starts to see his brother in the context of a family. And now he realizes that the money he's getting from Theo might do well for Theo's own family. Um, before that, he had visited in Paris Theo's apartment, and for the first time, he realizes um, the non-sale of his work when he is in the apartment. And by the way, Theo names his child Vincent. Very, very close brothers, and um, Vincent notices that all of his paintings are under the bed, in the closets, anywhere where they could be stacked but none of them are in a gallery. None of them are being sold. So with that visit, plus the second visit, Vincent starts to realize that maybe all the hope is lost. So the day of his self-inflicted wound, he goes out. It's called uh, over the wheat field, crows over the wheat field. Now, if you look at this painting, it almost tells me, and Believe me, there are better scholars and people that know maybe a lot more, or probably a lot more. But for me, looking at this painting years later, is there's a road here through the wheat field, but it's definitely cut off. Okay, so to me, it represents Van Gogh's life himself being cut off, and the sound of the gunshot alerts the birds and scares them out of the wheat field. And the sky is painted, not like a sky that you would love to be in, but a threatening sky. The blues and almost purple and the blackness. How many of us, when we see a storm coming, run for shelter? And I think in some ways, Van Gogh was running for shelter the only way he knew how. And like I said, it was, a terrible wound the last three days. So why do we know so much about him? We come to Theo's wife. Theo dies, amazingly, six months after his brother. Um, there are rumors or maybe some um, theories or more than facts that Theo might have had syphilis. Um, but I've only seen it appear once and um, I try to take things that are corroborated in multiple times. But needless of the fact, I think it's almost right. He dies, uh, like I said, shortly after. Theo's wife does an amazing thing. She starts to write to all the artists that knew Vincent, his family and friends, and ask, were there any correspondence from Vincent? And many, many people started sending her, whether it the authentic letter, or they made a copy. They sent the letters of Vincent to her, and she puts them together. Eventually, it's published as the letters of Vincent van Gogh. And then eventually, of course, his paintings get discovered, and the rest is history of Vincent van Gogh. And they have a little it's the burial plot. And I think 
Theo probably died more of grief than anything else. Okay, it's backwards, but two little grave markers for them. And I don't know, do we take questions? You want to? Yeah, sure. Okay. I got no answers, but you, sure. can, you, know, okay. you can question away. Uh, let's see how. Do we... Does anybody have a question? Let's see. Oh. Uh, where did everybody go? It's so strange how I got Okay. Okay. Um, if anybody has a question, feel free to unmute yourself and ask it. Okay, if, if maybe next time we'll make it available, but let me also bring up something of uh, Vincent. Um, so how do I approach these programs? I try to use everything personal about what I'm, what I'm looking at. Um, this is a chair. This is Vincent's chair, and we, we know it because of his pipe. And he's got his tobacco. He loved, he loved his pipe and his tobacco. But what I also see in the chair is Vincent telling us that yes, he's not sitting there, but we feel his his presence. And I remember, to me, art is a metaphor for life. And I remember after the passing of my dad, the hardest thing that I had to deal with after that wasn't his actual passing, but when the entire family went out to have a dinner, I said to my sister, I said, this will be the hardest part. And she said to me, why do you say that? I said, because his chair will be empty. And when I saw this, it kind of gave me that same feeling that, you know, if there was a memorial to Vincent, it would just be this simple chair and his pipe and his tobacco. So listen, once again, I want to thank the Stoughton Senior Center. Awesome. You know, it's just the availability and make things happen. Hope to come back and um, tell a friend if you enjoyed it. Um, you know, liking and disliking are both equal. So let the staff know how it went. Thanks again.